Good morning. Yeah. I think it's okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay, good morning everyone. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> you had a good breakfast? Uh, yeah? <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, let us get down to business. Uh, <coughs> so, we're having a looking at this uh, marvelous Anapana Sati Sutta, uh, which uh, takes you through all the um, uh, aspects of Anapana Sati from the very beginning uh, all the way to the very end of the path. So it's very, very comprehensive and very detailed and has basically everything you need in there for the full practice of the noble of the path, uh, uh, which is very handy. Uh, um, and it's not that hard to understand. There's a few little uh, things in there which are a little bit tricky, but generally speaking, it's uh, not that difficult, which is, which is good. Uh. So, so far we have looked at the uh, part which is equivalent to the Kaya Nupassana, page 63. Uh, the Kaya Nupassana, uh, uh, which is the first part of the Satipatthana Sutta, the body contemplation. And this is what we have looked at so far, the first four steps. Uh, the Anapanasati Sutta is divided into 16 steps, 4 times 4, uh, and each one of these groups of 4 is equivalent to one of the uh, 4 Satipatthanas. So there is a direct correlation there between the 4. Uh. And uh, so once we have looked at the body contemplation, the first 4, then the next group of 4 is about Vedana Nupassana, contemplation of feeling. Uh. And uh, this is a uh, quite handy because when you, as I mentioned yesterday, when you look at the contemplation of feeling in the Satipatthana Sutta, it is not at all clear how it's supposed to be done because there it just says you know this feeling, you understand that feeling. Uh, it doesn't give any context, doesn't say anything about meditation or anything like that. So it's very kind of hard to figure it out. But here you get the context. Uh, and the context is breath meditation and all you have to do is watch the breath uh, and then you are also doing uh, Vedana, Nupassana, contemplation of feeling at the same time. Uh, so very handy. So um, let's have a, have a look at this. So let's, I'll just, as usual, I'll just read it out and then we will comment on it afterwards. So he trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing rapture. This is piti here. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing rapture. Uh, he trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing pleasure. Huh? He shall trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing pleasure. Huh? He trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the mental formation. Huh? He trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the mental formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the mental formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, breathe out tranquilizing the mental formation. So this is all about feelings, uh, yeah, starting off with piti, then you have sukha is the second one, the pleasure, uh, the mental formation here, this is a uh, citta sankara in Pali, and citta sankara is a word that means um, the feelings and the perceptions of the mind. Yeah? So feelings is a, c is a kind of joint gr a term for feelings and perceptions of the mind. Uh, yeah. So it could be translated the activity of the mind, uh, that's an another possibility. Uh, uh, but basically it is whatever you are experiencing in the present moment in the mind. And then you have the tranquilizing of that uh, uh, at the very end there. Uh. And one of the nice things about this, which it kind of stands out straight away, uh, is that it is all about positive emotions, yeah, all about positive feelings, uh, this particular part. Uh. And uh, that's very interesting because when you read the Vedana Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta, it talks about experiencing painful feelings. Uh, yeah, uh, it talks about the uh, Samisa Dukkha Vedana. Samisa means like carnal or worldly. Uh, then you have the Niramisa Dukkha Vedana, which is the painful feeling that is uh, spiritual or unworldly. Some people translate it as. Uh, yeah, so uh, in there it talks about painful feelings and neutral feelings as well as well as happy feelings. But here it is all about happy feelings. So what does that mean? How do we how do we kind of uh, understand this? Why is it is it necessary to contemplate from this? It seems you can just skip all the painful feelings. Yeah, that's what this looks like. Don't have to worry about them. 
So how do we gain insight into the painful feelings if we skip them? And the way you gain insight into them uh, is by their absence. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, you will already had some painful feelings already, because as you sit in meditation, it's impossible not to have a little bit of painful feelings sometimes. Uh, it c cannot happen, even if you try your very best to be super duper comfortable. Uh, yeah, there's always going to be some painful feelings in the body. But at this point, those painful feelings recede into the background, uh, and they are very getting more and more difficult to notice. And the deeper you go in the meditation, the less painful feelings there are. And eventually, there's just happy feelings, nothing left. Uh, and it is by the absence of these feelings that you actually come to understand them. Uh, because absence is the highest kind of anicca, of impermanence. Uh, so what we are ultimately, what we are contemplating is anicca. By understanding the complete absence of something, uh, you also understand its anicca nature fully. Uh. So you don't actually have to contemplate these things yeah, by their pre in their presence. Uh, sometimes their absence is plenty good enough to understand these things. Uh, uh, and, uh, so, uh, and this is kind of the, the beautiful thing about the Anapanasati Sutta. And it uh, shows you this alternative way of contemplating suffering uh, or pain. Uh, doesn't involve pain at all. Uh, it's kind of uh, handy. It actually does involve pain because, as I mentioned, you already have a bit of pain beforehand uh, and now suddenly it is gone uh, and that's how you under come to understand it. Uh. And this is one of those principles about, uh, you know, Dhamma, it's a principle, general principle in many different things. Uh. If you want to understand something, uh, you have to uh, isolate it completely. Uh. And one way of isolating it here is allowing it to disappear. Uh. So, for example, when you, if you want to understand the sensual realm of, of all the sensual world, the five senses, uh, the best way to do that is to actually eliminate the sensual realm completely. And when it's completely gone, that's when you understand what it is. Uh, because uh, uh, as long as you are immersed in it, uh, you don't fully understand its boundaries. Uh. Once you withdraw from it completely, uh, you fully understand its boundaries, uh, and then you can understand what is going on. Uh. So absence is a very powerful way of understanding things. Uh. So that's quite nice, isn't it? No need to contemplate painful feeling. Uh. Is that a good news or, or what? Uh, it's good news, isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that's what you have right there in the Anapana Sati Sutta. So it starts off then by experiencing rapture. And uh, sometimes uh, in the uh, previous section it ends off with tranquilizing the uh, bodily formation, which I said is can be translatable as the bodily activity. And of course, one of the main bodily activities at that point is the breath. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of activity happening in the body. So how do we go from the bodily activity uh, to experiencing the rapture? Uh? Sometimes people get stuck on that point. Uh, yeah, you may get very peaceful, you may feel really at ease and relaxed, and everything is wonderful. Uh, but actually giving rise to those positive feelings, uh, that doesn't often not always happen automatically. For some people it happens automatically. You just do it and as you become peaceful, uh, these uh, beautiful feelings start to arise. Uh, but sometimes uh, it doesn't seem to happen quite so straightforwardly. Uh. And this is where this idea that I mentioned before, uh, where the Buddha talks about the various kinds of anusattis, of recollections, uh, well this is where that can come in. Uh. The Buddha talks usually about six kinds of recollections, and this is something you see in, again, in many, many places in the suttas. Uh, so for this reason, it is an important part of the meditation path. Uh, and the, these recollections, they are always the foundation for attaining samadhi. So it's all about, uh, you know, meditation practice. Uh, uh, and, uh, but really, anything that helps you become more, you know, give a rise to a little bit of joy in the meditation. Uh, and because you are very peaceful here, because your mind is already quite pure, yeah, you're focused on the breath, everything is peaceful, it is not that hard to give rise to a little bit of joy in the meditation. Uh, yeah, so you sit back, you're peaceful, and then you kind of reflect on something, you think, oh wow, how lucky I am to be part of this group and to be here, how, what a wonderful thing it is that this BGF is here, how great it is to have companions like this, or something simple like that. Uh, or just kind of an appreciation of the Dhamma, appreciation that you have these marvelous teachings. Uh, or, uh, uh, as the Buddha talks about, the Sila Nusati, the Chaga Nusati, you just remember something in the past. Uh, yeah, ideally that hap didn't happen too long ago, uh, and then that gives rise to the joy here. Uh. But uh, 
it's not, this is not about a lot of thinking here, because now you're already very peaceful, so if you think a lot, you're going to disturb the meditation, yeah? So this is more like just a very small nudge of the mind. You nudge the mind in a certain direction, uh, just to give rise to a perception, a particular way of looking at the world, uh, and that perception is enough then to give you a little bit of energy in the mind, uh, a bit of pamuja, a bit of gladness, uh, because you, you know you're doing the right thing, practicing in the right way. Uh. So this is how here, th this idea of uh, the various anusatis, the recollections, uh, uh, come in. And uh, another, another way of doing this is uh, what I suggested yesterday, the idea of just seeing the breath in a particular way, uh, yeah, looking upon the breath as an old friend, or it's like you make almost like to make the breath into a being, yeah, like a friend. Uh, and by just by looking at the breath in a friendly way, yeah, in a with kind of kindness or whatever, uh, and maybe a sense of gratitude, gratitude can be very useful to give rise to a bit of joy, uh, then again, uh, these things may happen uh, as a consequence. So then you can make that transition from uh, just the breath uh, to the feelings. Uh. So this is uh, one way of uh, dealing with this. Uh. So uh, what, what are these things? And uh, you will notice that these are similar to the things that we were looking at yesterday. Uh, yeah, yesterday we were talking about the, um, uh, the uh, um, not, not the grad dependent liberation sequence, uh, yeah, where you move from starting with sila, then moving up to the various kinds of happiness, and you end with samadhi. And here you see some of the same terms. You have rapture, which is piti, you have suk happy pleasure, which is sukha, and these are the ki exactly the same terms that you see in that de dependent liberation sequence. Uh, so here we are essentially doing that same sequence. Yeah, so we're going through the same thing. You can see the parallels, but it's also slightly different. The order is slightly different. There's more added uh, in this particular order, in this particular sutta. So you have more detail as to what is happening here. But you start off with a rapture, yeah? and the rapture again is often the very kind of powerful, physically felt pleasure, uh, yeah, uh, like coursing through the body, uh, and then, uh, and as you are doing this, the meditation, the breath is still there, right, at this point, uh, it's just that you have this, <coughs> this double perception of the breath together with the positive feelings, uh, the two kind of coming together, this is what is happening here, uh. so you have the breath, and you have the, uh, the physical feelings, of course, because the breath now is less prominent, because the main kind of thing that is happening now is the happiness, because the happiness is obviously very important, because this is what is attractive, it means that your attention tends to go more to the happiness uh, than to the breath. Uh, so already your attention is moving a little bit uh, towards the things that are really enjoyable. Uh. So uh, the breath is f starting to fade a little bit into the background, uh, and then as you do this, you keep on watching the breath, yeah, if you feel that you are uh, uh, losing kind of your the plot a little bit, uh, you always come back to the breath. The breath is like the anchor here. The breath is the thing that you, uh, you know, keeps you on track. Yeah. So even though the feelings become powerful, uh, still the breath is the thing that kind of enables you to make progress. Uh. So you stay with the breath, even though the feeling becomes powerful. And as you do that, uh, it calms down further. And then the feelings become more subtle, and that's why the sukkha is the next stage. Sukkha is a more subtle, pleasurable feeling than the uh, piti. Uh. So you're kind of moving in that direction. Uh. Remember yesterday we were talking about piti, then pasadi, calm, uh, and then sukkha. Uh, yeah? So sukkha coming after piti. It's more mental, it is not as physical as piti. The body is fading away more. Uh. This is what happens when you calm down. Everything fades away more, especially the physical phenomena like the body and the breath. Uh. And then you have experiencing the mental formation. And uh, again, the mental formation here can be translated as mental activity, or it can be uh, seen as just the feelings and the perceptions uh, that exist at that particular time. Uh, Ajahn Sujata translates that as emotion. Uh, yeah, so you are experiencing emotion, and I think that is uh, probably uh, just about okay. It's, it, it, it's very, it's more clear. Mental formation is a very unclear kind of translation, hard to know what it's meant. Uh, but it's just uh, more of feelings, more positive feelings is really what it means, yeah? And again, moving forward. Uh, 
And then uh, towards the very end of the Vedana Nupassana, you have the tranquilizing of the mental activity. Uh. So at this stage there is still some, it is not 100% peaceful, uh. there is still some movement of the mind, yeah, the feelings are not entirely stable, uh, there's still a bit of movement back and forth, uh, so you want to tranquilize this and make it more stable, more samadhi, more unified. Uh, so this is what is happening here. Uh, and all the way through this process, uh, this is not something that you do, uh, this is something that happens automatically by just being aware, by just standing back, yeah, just allowing the process to happen. Uh, all, you do, uh, all you're doing uh, is enjoying the process itself. Uh, you're just seeing these things happening inside of you as an automatic process. Just standing back, uh, feeling the whole world becoming beautiful as you stand back. And the more you stand back and observe, the more beautiful everything becomes. Uh, it's kind of uh, marvelous, isn't it? Uh, all you have to do is relax. Uh, and the more you relax, uh, the more you kind of, in relaxation, everybody likes to relax anyway. So if you really relax, uh, things become even better. Uh, it's really, uh, it's such a beautiful path once you understand it. Uh, you don't really have to do anything here. Uh, you just need to enjoy, uh, just need to do the right things uh, and then things kind of happen automatically. Uh. The people who are really good at meditation, all they do, they uh, often they, all they do is just sit back, uh, relax and then everything just boom happens. Yeah, And you see nimittas and you go into jhanas and all these kind of things. Uh. You have to be a really good meditator for that to happen. But it, uh, you know, uh, this is what happens. Uh. You don't have to do anything at all. This bang overwhelms you. These are marvelous things. Uh. So that is the uh, Vedana Nupassana part, uh, uh, coming f uh, as done through Anapanasati. And then we come to the third part. And the third part is in the uh, <coughs> Satipatthana Sutta, is the Chitta Nupassana, the contemplation of mind. Yeah, Chitta means mind. Or chitta also means mind states. It doesn't mean just the mind as a uh, as an overall thing, but it can be an individual mind states so or individual individual mind qualities. Uh, so this one here is like a contemplation of mind states or so qualities of mind. Is what we're seeing here, chitta nupassana. Uh, and um, so uh, let me again read this one out, uh, and then we can talk about it. So. He trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in gladdening the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out gladdening the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in stilling the mind. He breathes thus, I shall breathe out stilling the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in liberating the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, liberating the mind. So all about mind, 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 all the way through. So uh, what does it mean, mind? How come suddenly now we're talking about mind, whereas before not talking about mind? Isn't all that pleasure and happiness, isn't that also mind? What is, going, what is exactly going on here? How, how are we now experiencing this mind? And to, uh, I, I think the most the natural interpretation of this, which, is, which makes a lot of sense to me. And, and many of these things are things I have just picked up over the years from people like Ajahn Brahm especially, because uh, uh, again, he is, uh, has always been my number one meditation teacher for obvious reasons. But um, a mind here is now when you're experiencing the mind in this particular case, uh, then mind only becomes apparent when the things that are not mind disappear. Yeah, it's this idea again of isolating something and then you can see it clearly for what it actually is. So what are the things that are not mind? And in Buddhism we divide the world into six senses, yeah? whereas mind is only one of the six senses. So when the other five senses fade away, that is when you find out what the mind is. So at this particular point, what is happening, the five senses uh, are fading away very powerfully. Uh, yeah? They are still there in the background because we are still using the breath as the anchor. So the breath is there. Uh, but at this point, pretty much all that is left of the five senses is the breath. Uh. That's pretty much all that is left. There's also uh, a little bit of hearing because the hearing sense is usually the last one to disappear in meditation practice. Uh, so you may hear a little bit, at least occasionally, if there's a sound that is a little bit loud, like some of these motorcycles down on the street. Uh, you hear them sometimes, uh, yeah, they're, they're revving up and they really make a big noise. Uh, so um, 
they don't know how much bad karma they're making. Yeah, they're disturbing the meditators. Uh. <laughs> so, um, uh, and so this kind of, you can hear something like that in the background maybe, or something like that. And the deeper the meditation is, uh, the less you can hear. Uh. And it's like things are far away or, or something like that. That's how it often feels. Uh. So at this stage, the mind, yeah, because the senses are fading away, this is where you have things like the samadhi nimitta arising here. Yeah. The samadhi nimitta is often the thing that is talked about in Buddhist circles, is the kind of like the light you see in meditation practice, yeah? Like the sun or the moon or the stars or something like that, or a bright light shining in your eyes. Uh. And there are some wonderful stories about that. The nimitta can be extremely bright. And if you're not uh, used to these kind of experiences, it's like, uh, you know, it's like you don't know what is going on. There was a story, there was a, a lady, she was uh, originally from Vietnam, and she ha had emigrated to Australia. She was one of these boat refugees, I think. Uh, we have lots of them in Australia, because Australia is not that far from Vietnam. And they would go from Vietnam to Indonesia, and then come to Australia later on. And there was one lady, she was living in Melbourne. Her. And uh, she, because the um, usual type of Buddhism they are used to in Vietnam is Mahayana Buddhism, yeah, so they have Kuan Yin and all of this, all of these things, uh, very similar to many other of the East Asian forms of Buddhism. And uh, so she went to this monastery, yeah, she had arrived not so long ago in Australia, and she was naturally drawn to the Mahayana monastery. And in this monastery it had this big statue on Kuan Yin. And of course, if you come from Vietnam, you come to Australia, Australia is a kind of very uh, foreign culture to you, so it's very comforting to come to the Mahayana Monastery and you see some of the old symbols, yeah, and you see the Kuan Yin statue, it makes you very happy when you see Kuan Yin. Uh. So she went over to Kuan Yin statue and she kind of bowed down to the Kuan Yin. Uh. And then she saw this light, yeah, this very, very powerful light. Uh. And she tried to put her hands over the face, she, I think she, she thought it was the sun or something, put her, but it didn't work. Uh. She put her hands over her eyes, uh, still, the light was still there. <laughs> and of course what is happening there is that you feel so happy, yeah, you kind of come back to your temple and you bow down to the Kuan Yin statue, obviously have a very pure heart, uh, yeah, a very pure mind, uh, and then you bow down, and what you see is a nimitta, and then when you see the nimitta, it's so blinding uh, that you kind of don't know what to, you're doing, so you try to cover up your eyes, uh, but actually it doesn't work because uh, it's actually coming in your mind itself. Uh. And this gives you an idea of what these uh, samadhi nimittas can be when they become very powerful. But often they start off in a much simpler way. They often start off like, can be, uh, they don't have to be the in the beginning very often. It is more like seeing something a bit more dull, uh, something not so bright. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, it becomes brighter as you go through this process uh, here that we have just been talking about. Yeah? It becomes brighter and brighter. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, so this is this process of the nimitta. And, uh, at that point, uh, this is where you have kind of isolated the mind. This is kind of one of the main meanings of mind, is this uh, uh, experience of uh, this samadhi nimitta. Now, it's uh, one of the things that is kind of, well, maybe I should mention briefly at this point, is that this word samadhi nimitta, it is used in different ways, and it's important to understand how it is used. It's very commonly used in uh, uh, Buddhist culture or Buddhist meditation circles. The word nimit nimitta uh, often is used. Anything you see in the mind is called the nimitta very often. Uh, so you may see something, you may you know, have an experience, people see all kinds of things in the meditation practice because the mind becomes powerful. Uh, then so the mind creates all kinds of stuff. You may see heavenly realms, and sometimes people see, see really uh, you know, slightly uh, scary things like, you know, ghosts maybe or something like that. Uh, uh, and uh, all of these things can arise, and these things are often called nimittas, especially if you have a creative mind. Uh, most people don't see anything. All you see is just kind of blankness, and if you're lucky you see a, a one of these samadhi nimittas, but some people see all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and most of the time, it doesn't mean anything. It's just your mind creating things. Uh, the mind is very creative, and you know that from your dreams, how creative the mind is, yeah? Oh, sometimes the dreams are so crazy. <laughs> you wonder where it all comes from. And I, I think a lot of dreams must come from past lives, probably, kind of deep buried memories, because I can't relate some of my dreams to anything that's happened in this life. It don't make any sense to me at all. Uh, so it's kind of strange. Uh. So this is one meaning of the idea of nimitta, or nimitta. And um, 
Uh, and the, but the meaning in the suttas is quite interesting because the word samadhi nimitta occurs in the suttas as well. But it does not mean the kind of bright light that you see in meditation in the suttas. In the suttas the samadhi nimitta means the object of meditation. Whatever your object is. So the breath can be a samadhi nimitta. You, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, corpse meditation. Yeah, it is specifically said in one of the suttas that when you do the corpse meditation, the corpse is a samadhi nimitta. It is the object of your meditation practice. It can turn into a bright sun, but initially it is just an object that you're using for that meditation uh, uh, practice. So uh, it is important to understand these slight differences, uh, uh, because otherwise you may misread what is going on when you read the suttas. Uh, and uh, th so these little things are important to. Uh, to understand. So, uh, uh, so this is the mind. Yeah, basically, it is about the, um, uh, w w at the probably the stage when we are ex starting to experience the samadhi nimitta and uh, well the nimitta and the body and the five senses are fading away. They're still there in the background, but the mind is now what is the main experience that you have. Uh, and uh, so this is the first part here. Then you have the idea of gladdening the mind. You train gladdening the mind. Uh, and uh, so in the sense the samadhi nimitta may be a little bit dull. Yeah, it's not super sharp. You are happy but not super happy. And so you allow the mind to become more happy. <laughs> and again, training here just means uh, the ability to stand back, to be passive. Uh, yeah, the more passive you are, the more uh, the more this experience just happens completely by itself uh, and uh, the mind becomes gladder and gladder as you allow it to be. And this is really one of the main things in the training here uh, is just the ability to be passive. Uh. And when I say ability to pass be passive, I don't mean forcing yourself to be passive. It's not like you are doing the passivity, it is like you are just letting go and therefore being passive. This is what it means. Uh, you're just standing back. Uh, yeah? You're not kind of holding on, passive, I shall be passive. No, you're actually allowing it to be passive. Huh? And then as you are doing that, the mind becomes gladder. Huh? Yeah? It means the pity and sukha are becoming uh, more uh, uh, powerful in one way, but also more subtle in another way. Huh? Yeah? Becoming very, very strong emotions uh, in the mind. Uh, and because of that, it's very, very attractive. Because huh? it's very attractive, huh? the stillness becomes greater. Huh? The mind stops moving. Huh? You're just allowing the mind to settle on this object. Huh? Very beautiful object. Uh, and you're just enjoying it more and more. So the mind becomes still. And this is the idea here of concentrating the mind. Uh, but I have, we are banned at Bodhinyana Monastery from saying the word concentration, so we say stilling the mind instead. Yeah. So uh, I know that these, some of these videos, they go on the internet, yeah, so maybe by accident Ajahn Brahm might see it. Uh, so if I, I have to kind of toe the line with uh, saying stilling rather than concentrating. <laughs> but actually it's a very good point uh, Ajahn Brahm has, because concentration usually means that you are using force, yeah? You're concentrating on something, you're trying really hard to focus, by reading or doing your job, and usually it Im implies using force when we concentrate. So actually it's a very good point that uh, uh, that can be very misleading for most people, and that's why they may end up using force in the meditation practice. Uh, so stilling is much nicer, it doesn't have that uh, sense of force about it. Uh. And then uh, uh, once you have concentrated the, the mind, then the very last one uh, is liberating the mind. Yeah? The mind is stilled, uh, and eventually, as you keep on stilling it, uh, there comes a point when the mind is liberated. Uh. And liberation in Buddhism has different meanings depending on the context. Uh. Uh, and h here it does not mean the final liberation of becoming an arahant or anything like that. Uh, here the liberation refers to the liberation that happens when you go into a deep state of samadhi. This is like the jhana, entering a jhana state is what is meant here by liberation. The suttas make a distinction between samaya vimoka and asamaya vimoka. And uh, samaya vimoka means like uh, a temporary uh, liberation. Uh, liberation has to do with time. Samaya is time yeah, or occasion. Asamaya means beyond time or outside of time. It's a complete, final liberation. So what we're talking about here is the Samaya Vimoka. It is temporary liberation of the mind. Uh, and what is the mind liberated from? Why is this called liberation? And one of the reasons why it is called liberation is because the five senses are gone. Uh, 
Yeah, the body is gone now. You've entered a different world. You're liberated from the world that you usually know, which is the world of the five senses. And it's kind of hard to understand what that is, isn't it? Uh, be being completely liberated from the world of the five senses, it's kind of different to really grasp it. And the reason it's hard to grasp is because we are so immersed in this world. Uh, we're so completely engulfed in the five senses uh, that it's actually difficult to even envisage uh, what it means to be released from that. Uh, but uh, what the suttas are saying, and this is what the kind of the whole point of liberation, is that it is an incredible relief to get out of this world of the five senses. Uh, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to you. Uh, but because we are so engulfed in it, because it is so much of who we are, because we identify so much with these five senses, actually, sometimes it feels a bit scary. Yeah, because we are, it's like we're letting go of everything we know. And we all know what that is like sometimes, you let go of everything you know. Actually, that's pretty, <laughs> that it can be very scary. And this is why sometimes people get afraid. And you get afraid of something which is very beautiful and very and absolutely marvelous. But because it is unknown, because it is uncertain, that is why it can be frightening. And um, it is not just that we are letting go of the five senses. Of course, we're also letting go of all the defilements in this case. The five hindrances are completely gone at this point. The mind is incredibly bright. Yes, yeah, super bright, super mindful. It is the most kind of the best mind you ever had in your entire life. You think, wow, I want to be here forever. But then, of course, you have to come out afterwards. But, you know, that this is what it feels like. Yeah. And um, uh, the other thing that you're liberated from at this point, which also is a bit can be scary, but actually it's a liberation. Yeah, it's like you people want to liberate you out of prison. You say, no, I don't want to go out of prison. I, and you hold on to prison. This is kind of a little bit what it's like. Yeah. So, but what you are liberated from here as well is all the doing activity of the mind, the will, the volition, all of that uh, stops because the mind becomes fully unified. This is the idea of samadhi when the mind is completely stilled, uh, yeah, no movement anymore. Then there's no will there because the will is what moves the mind. Uh, is the thing that actually drives things. Uh. This is another reason why it is a bit kind of concerning, uh, even though it is great. Uh, it is a bit concerning. Uh. So. Uh, uh, and the way to kind of overcome that uh, slight fear or anxiety or worry that might come at this stage is just to keep on doing it, uh, to get used to it uh, and find that actually uh, uh, being scared is crazy. I'm being scared of happiness. That's what I'm being scared of. Uh, there's no point in being scared of happiness. And eventually you, you do it uh, because you become familiar with the territory and you realize uh, this is actually an extraordinarily positive experience. Uh, so this is the idea of liberating the mind, vimochayang chitang. And again, liberating here doesn't mean that you are doing anything. You're not doing any liberating. It is rather just the process of being passive, of being aware, of allowing this to happen by itself. That is really what is uh, the, m the meaning of liberating here. Allowing the process to happen, yeah? Allowing things to still down, stepping back, being the passive observer, and allowing the process to go on. Uh, this is the idea of this. Uh. So this is the uh, citta nupassana, equivalent to the third part of the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, and again, uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, they talk about the contemplation of all the negative states of mind. Yeah, they talk about the uh, contemplating the greed, the anger, the delusion, all of that. Uh, but again, there's nothing really here about that. Uh, so uh, uh, these qualities of the mind will still be there to some extent in the background. Yeah, they will be very, very weak at the beginning, especially at the beginning of this. Uh, uh, and what you are seeing here, you're kind of seeing them fade away gradually until those defilements are completely gone. Uh, so again, mostly you are understanding these things by their absence, by their final fading away, by how they disappear. Uh, you don't have to kind of contemplate uh, these defilements in, you know, it, you don't have to kind of be angry to contemplate these defilements. Uh, actually, it's impossible to contemplate them when you're angry. It's only when they become very, very weak and they are about to fade away. That is when you can really come to understand these things. Uh, just as with the painful feelings, if you have a lot of pain, it's difficult to understand the painful feelings. Uh, but when the painful feelings become very subtle, they're just there in the background a little bit. Uh, that is where you really can understand them. Uh, and exactly the same, thi same thing here with the mental states. Uh, Fading away, yeah. So one, it's an amazing path, isn't it? Uh, it's just this astonishingly wonderful path, and so also very kind of 
happy but also kind of mysterious. We're going to kinds of happiness that we ne most people have never had before. They have no idea that these things actually exist. We need the Buddha to point out you know, there's so much happiness to be had in this world uh, and most people never have any chance to actually experience these things because they haven't been taught, they haven't been told or whatever else it is. Uh, but it's all there, uh, just waiting for us to uh, kind of grasp the opportunity and get going on this path. Uh, it's uh, one of these uh, uh, astonishing, marvelous things that these things even exist. Uh. So there you are. So that is taking the Anapanasati all the way to the jhanas. Uh, liberating the mind is kind of the last thing there, and you could say that that liberation uh, uh, can be many different levels depending on the depth of jhana that you attain. Yeah, You have the sama, samadhi, uh, uh, includes the four jhanas, so all the four jhanas could really be said to be included in that. And the deeper that liberation is, uh, the more powerful it is for the insight that comes afterwards. Uh, and uh, throughout, throughout this, the breath is kind of still a little bit in the background, uh, yeah, where it can be sometimes, uh, uh, but then when you finally get liberated, then the breath, bang, is completely gone. Uh. Then, uh, after you come out of the samadhi, this is what happens. Now we come to the last stage of this whole process, uh, and this is equivalent to the Dhamma Nupassana of the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, and Dhamma Nupassana, it is kind of controversial what the word Dhamma means in that particular context. Uh, uh, some people say it means mental uh, states, qualities of mind. Uh, other people argue that it means principles. Uh, because uh, the principle that come is most important in Dhamma Nupassana is the principle of causality. How do these various states arise? Why do we get upset sometimes? Uh, why do we have desire? Yeah, all of these kind of things is the sort of things that you contemplate in Dhamma Nupassana. You try to understand why these defilements arise and it's once you start to see it, you, it's, uh, you know, at least the coarse defilements is very obvious why they arise, whereas the more refined ones takes more, uh, more insight and more work to understand. Uh. So this is the last one. So Again, so what happens here is the following. I'll, I'll read it out again and then we'll uh, discuss the various details here. Uh. He trains thus, Asha breathe in, contemplating impermanence, anicca. He trains thus, Asha breathe out, contemplating impermanence. Uh. He trains thus, Asha breathe in, contemplating fading away, viraga. He trains thus, Asha breathe out, contemplating fading away. Uh. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, contemplating cessation, niroda. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating cessation. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, contemplating relinquishment, pati nisaga. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating relinquishment. So this is the Dhamma Nupasana. And uh, uh, what this sequence is, it is a sequence of ever more profound impermanence. So you start off with just a general idea of anicca, and impermanence in this sense can just mean the general kind of movements of the mind, that the mind is always changing or the body is changing, and just the being aware of change is really just the starting point here. Yeah, you can see you see things kind of moving around. So this can be a, be a very general sense of impermanence. It's not necessarily very profound in the beginning here, but then it moves on to viraga, to fading away. Things gradually starting to disappear. Yeah, things becoming less and less prominent in your mind, in your perception. Uh, this is the idea of viraga. This word viraga in Buddhism has two meanings. Uh, it can mean either raga, which means desire. Viraga is the opposite, non-desire. This is a very uh, common usage in the suttas. Uh, it means that your craving is dying down. It's a, it's a synonym for non-craving, viraga. But viraga also has the meaning of fading away, disappearing. And in this sense, it's very similar to niroda, cessation in Buddhism, uh, in, the, in this path. Uh. So things fade away. You can see how gradually the external world, things are disappearing, yeah? things are kind of fading away in your mind, uh, until eventually they cease completely. And this is the most powerful aspect of impermanence, is when things completely cease. Uh, all of this is a uh, comes under the umbrella of impermanence. All of this is part of the idea of anicca, things fading away and eventually disappearing. Uh, and, the, and the most powerful impermanence, 
cessation itself, uh, that is the most powerful, where you get the most powerful insights. And because things fade away completely, they disappear, uh, then what you realize is that all of that was not really worth holding on to. It was all just dukkha and problematic and all these kind of things. Uh, so because it's all dukkha, then you actually end up relinquishing it. And the idea of relinquishing is that you give it up completely. In other words, you stop craving for it. Uh, you're no longer interested in it. Uh, you no longer have attachment for it. Uh, that is the idea of relinquishment. And this is where the real insight happens, the real abandoning. Yeah? You give it all up, uh, you abandon it, and that's how you en eventually end up uh, going all the way to the end of the Buddhist path. Uh. So this is how, this is the progress of, uh, of insight, if you like. Here you have the anicca, of course when you see anicca you also see dukkha, when you see dukkha you also see anatta, all of these things coming together, part and parcel of the same thing. Yeah. When you see things fading away and ceasing and you think, wow, I feel so much happier now, you understand all the stuff that has ceased was dukkha. Yeah, that's what you, what you get. Uh, it's obvious. Uh, also, when something ceases completely, you, when you go into a state of jhana or whatever and things are completely ceased, you can no longer even access those things. Uh, if you cannot access something, uh, you know it must be anatta. It must be non-self. Why? Because the idea of something which is self is precisely something you can control. Yeah, that's what is self. But if you can't access it, obviously you can't control it. It's gone completely. It means it must be anatta. So this is why cessation is such a powerful moment for insight. You know these things are no longer part of you. They are suffering. You know it fully and completely at this particular point. So very powerful. And this is why you don't have to experience all of these things. You don't actually have to know, you don't have to be with pain or with defilements to understand them. Uh, actually it is their absence is a far more powerful point of uh, insight than uh, uh, their presence uh, in understanding these things. Uh. So what is it that we are contemplating in this way? It's a bit cryptic, yeah, contemplating Anicca, but what exactly is it that is Anicca? It doesn't say. So what is it that we are contemplating? And what we are contemplating the main thing, quite obvious when you think about it, is precisely the sequence we have just been through. Yeah, we've just been through this marvelous sequence starting from the very beginning where we have the long breath and the short breath, uh, all the way to until we enter the jhana states, we enter deep states of samadhi. And in that process, all of these things have happened in that process. What is it that is happening in that process? Well. One of the things that is happening is that the body has gradually been fading away. The more uh, uh, concentrated, the more still you are with the breath, uh, the more one-pointed you are, the less you feel the body. Uh, so the body is disappearing, yeah? the sense of touch, the sense of feeling, uh, whatever it is. Uh, until the breath also disappears completely, then the body is completely gone, a complete cessation. Uh, so you see the fading away of the body, the viraga, then the cessation of the body, uh, and you get insight into the nature of the body. Uh. Another thing that is disappearing is the five senses. Uh, you can see how the five senses get weaker and weaker, uh, how there's more and more contact with the world, uh, less and less contact with the world. Uh, and uh, eventually the hearing is also completely gone. The very last thing that uh, uh, usually people have a, an experience of is hearing. And then the hearing also is completely gone. The fading away, fading away of all the five senses uh, until they are completely gone. Bang, it's gone. Defilements of the mind, yeah? Defilements of the mind are disappearing. The mind is becoming more and more clear, more and more bright. You see the inverse relationship between the uh, defilements and the brightness of the mind, the beauty of the mind. Uh, and that inverse relationship is actually uh, mentioned in the suttas, uh, because in the suttas you have the hindrances on the one hand, uh, and the opposite of the hindrance, the counter to the hindrances, is the seven factors of awakening. Uh, they are the inverse of the hindrances. And as the hindrances die down, the seven of factors of awakening go, go up. It's like a scale, yeah? You, th these go down, these ones go up. Uh, and uh, the less hindrances you have, the more of the factors of awakening you have, and that is the energy, the piti, the tranquility, all of these wonderful factors of mind that you have. We'll talk more about those later on. Uh, all of that is happening, yeah? Hindrances fading away, other things happening instead, uh, until eventually they too cease completely uh, and have this very bright and stilled mind. Uh, your willpower is fading away, yeah? The mind is becoming more and more still, less and less movement. Uh, there's no 
access to being able to do things anymore. Uh, your ability to will is disappearing. Uh, you understand will. And this is kind of one of those very powerful things because we identify so much with our will. We are the doers in our life. You know, if you are a creative kind of person, I don't know if you, some of you may work in the more like creative industries, creation is an act of will, it's an act of doing. You identify as the doer. If you are a creator, if you are a musician, or you are an artist, or you work for some kind of other creative modern industry, a graphic designer, or whatever it is, all of these kind of people, you know, somebody like that, it's not just those people, because we all have some degree of creativity, of course, in our lives. Uh, as you do that, because you identify with the doer, it is kind of an astonishing insight to see that when the doer ceases, it's much better. Yeah, you have lived on this doer for your entire life. Your entire life is about doing things. Uh, and then one day you do nothing. Uh, you can't even do anything. Uh, and it's far superior. Uh, so this is one of those strange things. Yeah, you, we... Um, tend to glorify activity in our world and some people are very, very um, strongly attached to the sense of doing it. And then one day you let it go and it's far, far superior. Uh, so these things, this is why these things are, you know, so full, so pregnant, if you like, with insight. It's just waiting there for you to be able to realize these things uh, and these things are happening. So you're looking back at this process that's been happening, that's where the insight happens. Uh. So what exactly is this process? In what is another way of looking at this? And one of the other ways of looking at these things that we have just been talking about now, these things are the five khandhas. That's what they are, yeah? One of those very strange things is that very often, as I have had this question happen to me so many times, uh, people ask me, what are the five khandhas? And I say, yeah, well, you know, there are form khanda, feeling khanda, perception khanda, and then say people say, yeah, but what are they? Uh, <laughs> and it's a good point, because sometimes, they, like so many other things in Buddhism, they can end up like these uh, conceptual, these ideas that we have about the world. They are just concepts in our mind without having any reference to reality. Uh, what are they as experiences? That's what people probably really are asking about. Uh, how do I know that I'm experiencing a certain kanda? Because these are experiences. Uh, and what we are seeing in this process, we are seeing precisely the gradual fading away of the khandhas. What you are getting insight into here is insight into the five khandhas. And uh, an obvious one is the uh, rupa khanda. The rupa khanda obviously includes the physical body, the five senses and all of that. Uh, all of that is fading away. You're seeping, seeing the rupa khanda gradually fading away here. Yeah? Aspects of the rupa khanda coming to a complete cessation. Uh, they haven't ceased fully yet, even when you go into samadhi. There's a tiny little bit left, uh, but the vast majority of it has gone. Huh? The Vedana Kanda, you're seeing the Vedana Kanda changing. The initially, the Vedana Kanda is full of, you know, you have painful feelings, you have all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then certain feelings disappear. The painful feelings are gone. Huh? And then the happy feelings become more and more refined. Certain happy feelings disappear, and all you're left with is this very beautiful, subtle, happy feelings. Uh, and eventually those disappear too. Uh, and all you're left with is the upeka, the equanimity, the uh, uh, neither happy nor painful feelings. Yeah, this is kind of the highest reaches of the jhana states. Uh, all of that is fading away and disappearing. Uh. The sanya kanda is disappearing because when you start off, your perception is very scattered. Uh, yeah, you have perceptions that relate to all the five senses. Uh, and then your perceptions narrow down to one sense, the sense of the mind. Uh, it narrows down just to a very happy feeling, maybe a samadhi nimitta. And it narrows down further until you get into the first jhana. So perception is changing, becoming less and less and less, uh, narrowed down into one tiny little thing, uh, which is the perception you have in samadhi experience. Uh. The Sankara Kanda, the Sankara is really the will, the activity of the mind. Uh, that also, mind is becoming stiller and stiller and stiller. Sankara Kanda fading away until that too pretty much stops completely in the first jhana. Vijnana Kanda, uh, no, the um, awareness or consciousness uh, starts off with six senses and, until eventually only one sense is left. Uh, only one kind of Vijnana exists. Uh, yeah, and even that vinyana narrowed down to a very narrow field. Uh. So this is what we mean when we talk about the five khandhas and contemplating the five khandhas, uh, understanding the five khandhas. This is what it means. Uh. Yeah, this is what you're doing. Uh. It's actually fairly simple when you think about it. Uh. But when people say you must contemplate the five khandhas, people often have no idea what you're talking about. 
What do you mean, how are we supposed to contemplate the five khandhas? Uh, this is how you do it. You just watch the breath. And by watching the breath, uh, you get all of this coming to you in one go. Uh, it's good, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so this is how this, uh, uh, this happens. Uh, and one of the things that you also realize as you go through this process, uh, one of the things that is very useful here also is to understand the causality in this process. Uh, because that is a very important part of the Dhamma Nupasana. If you, we probably have a quick look at the Satipatthana Sutta uh, towards the end of the retreat. Uh, but Dhamma Nupasana is all about causality. Uh, it's all about understanding the hindrances, understanding why they are there. Yeah? What is it that causes these hindrances in the mind? Uh, understanding how you abandon the hindrances uh, and how they stay abandoned in the future. Uh. So causality is also a part of this. You understand not only that these things have disappeared and ceased, you understand why they have disappeared and ceased. Uh. And this is one of the reasons why it's useful at the end of meditation to take a few moments and this is one of the things I, I try to do, uh, you know, at also during the guided meditation, take a few moments just to reflect back on the process. Uh, why do I feel more peaceful now? Uh, what is it that I did? Uh, and very often what you realize is that you didn't do very much at all. That's why you feel peaceful. Uh, you were able to let go, you were able to just relax. Yeah, you just relaxed and it became peaceful. Uh, sometimes you can see it happening. And that is where you learn what you have to do, or what you don't have to do, whatever, however you want to say it. Uh, and it's such simple little things usually, very simple insights in what you have to do. And the more you reinforce that, uh, the more you reflect on it every time, the more you will enable yourself in the future to do these things. Uh. So, uh, that is the uh, Dhamma Nupassana part of the mindfulness of breathing, how to contemplate all of these things, how to gain insight from it. Uh, and usually it is a uh, uh, pretty automatic. The question is, do you have to go all the way to liberate in the mind uh, to be able to do this insight contemplation? And the answer is no. Uh, you go as far as you can uh, and then you kind of skip to the insight part afterwards when you're finished with your meditation, yeah, coming out of it. You, you take a bit of time and you contemplate it in terms of those four steps. So even if you, uh, you know, only get, even if you get just to a a short way on this path, uh, it is always good to contemplate a little bit uh, on your meditation practice. So uh, even if you just come to the maybe the happy feelings, maybe you don't even get happy feelings, maybe you just get the tranquil breath or whatever, still it is nice to contemplate a little bit on what is going on. Uh. But the contemplation becomes more powerful the deeper you go with the breath, uh, and the most powerful contemplation happens after a samadhi experience. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, and uh, if not, there will be today we will start the Q&A sessions again. So please uh, feel free to uh, do the Q&A session. And uh, uh, I am it's also nice, I think also the Venerable Bikuni over here also she can be very happy to answer some of those questions if she, if she would like, uh, because uh, uh, it's nice to get some different perspective on these things. Uh. So um, let us just have a look at the very end, uh, because uh, that is how mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and great benefit. Uh, and so when the Buddha says great fruit and great benefit, he really means great fruit and great benefit. Uh, the Buddha is not, he tends to be understated. Uh, yeah, this is one of the things that you need to see when you start reading the suttas. Uh, so when the Buddha says that you are happy, it means that you are so happy, you've never been so happy in your entire life. Uh, so, uh, and this is one of those classic things you read about the jhana experiences. Uh, and when the Buddha talks about the third jhana, he says, yeah, when you get to the third jhana, yeah, this is what the, uh, the noble ones call happiness in the world. Uh, and that happiness is the highest happiness you can possibly have. There's no happiness beyond that. Only then are you really happy. Everything else is kind of, yeah, it's all right, uh, but now this is really it. Uh, so the Buddha is always understated. Uh, so keep that in mind when you uh, read the suttas, uh, because uh, then uh, when the Buddha says great for the great benefit, it's not like in the modern world where everyone kind of exaggerates, uses, oh, it's awesome, awesome means nothing anymore, yeah? It just means, yeah, what well, is average, it's still awesome, yeah? How are you? I'm great, I'm, ec I'm ecstatic, yeah? People exaggerate. Actually, you're just feeling completely average, and then you say, are you feeling great? This is how people are, yeah? But when the Buddha says he's feeling great, 
it really means absolutely the top of the world, the absolute highest. Uh, the Buddha really is understated. Uh. And by the way, Ajahn Brah, you know that what uh, awesome is in Pali? Uh, Sadhu, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> this is Ajahn Brahm's translation for Sadhu. Uh, yeah. So Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh. And uh, it's a nice translation, actually, uh, because it kind of brings it out in a modern kind of jargon, which is, uh, which is great. Uh. Anyway, that is uh, uh, all for now. Uh. So uh, uh, let's have a short break and then come back and do some meditation together in about quarter past nine, fifteen minutes' time. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, okay. <laughs>